Jake, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Um, your first guest on this. Is that right? Yeah, in this new. I feel honoured. Well, no, we're really honoured. <laughs> um, I was saying to you, we've you know spent the last five years interviewing all sorts of doctors and neuroscientists and psychologists, and it's been amazing. I've learned so 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 much from you all, taken so much of it into my own life. But I think I feel so strongly that people are inspired by people, and I think yeah. there's a moment almost where you kind of. It's not that you stop learning, but it's starting to look at actually how do you apply those learnings? And what I really want to do in this season is start to show how do you actually apply all those different tools of the wellness industry to actually create a more meaningful, happier, healthier life. And the reason I was really keen to get you here today is I've listened to so many of your podcasts and I re-listened this weekend to a lot of your own personal kind of stories and your Mm. own episodes and I think that you talk about those challenges with your mental well-being in particular in such a vulnerable and candid way, but also with such a frankness of how to move forward, which I so appreciate and resonate with. So I wonder, before we kind of get started, if you'd be happy to introduce yourself, you know, obviously from the outside, we know you as a very successful sports presenter, podcast host, but I wondered if you could introduce yourself kind of fully as you, what would you like people to know about you? Yeah, it's a really good question, actually. Um, and, you know, you've definitely gone from the the other end of the spectrum if you've had neuroscientists and doctors to a former kids TV presenter, right? Um, but I suppose the thing I always like to explain to people is that being a TV presenter, whether it's a kids presenter, an F1 presenter, now a football presenter, or a podcaster, or a business owner, or even a dad or a husband, right? Those are all the things that I do. They're not actually who I am. Um, And I think one of the real challenges that we all have in the modern world is that it is so rife with opinion. You know, there will either be people on this podcast who don't know who I am and therefore they're learning now while I'm talking, or there will be people that do, and I guarantee you they'll have an opinion and almost an expectation of what I'm going to talk about. And one of the challenges, I think, with expectation is that when you go into a situation, you constantly measure yourself against that, right? And, And it totally changes the experience so if I have like an expectation of coming in and what this is going to be about it actually isn't a very free conversation because I'm constantly thinking is that what I thought is that what what did I prepare for and all that so I'm just a kind of I think I'm just a person that is constantly growing and changing and I'm now 44 which you can probably tell by the wrinkles on the forehead and around the eyes man I keep looking in the mirror thinking who's the old guy looking back at me oh no but I feel I'm growing actually more than ever before and I'm a big fan of stoicism, right? And the Stoics have a great phrase, which is the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is right now. And in some ways, I think that's quite a nice place to start for your listeners because there will be people listening to this that feel that this sort of conversation about wellness isn't for them or that maybe they haven't got the time for it or maybe they're too old for it. Or, but actually, like the, the second best time to do anything is this moment, right? Um, and I think I learned that really probably when I hit my 40s that I'd gone through the teenage years of not really knowing who I was and not doing much. Then actually it was a real whirlwind in the 20s and 30s when I bagged a job on kids telly and then Formula One with a lot of pressure and I left to join BT Sport, which was equally a lot of pressure. And I don't really think that I, I had much kind of like mental freedom in any of those things because I was constantly trying to be a TV presenter. Now I'm just kind of me. And... In some ways, what I love saying when they get asked this question is, I'm just a totally flawed, normal person who makes mistakes, has errors in him, falls short constantly, doesn't know the answer to very many things, definitely has imposter syndrome. Um, but actually, like that's what I am, and that's what, y- and you get all of that with me. And once you admit that to people, I think it's actually a really freeing experience for you and for them. Oh, 100%. And I so appreciate that. And I don't want to sound like your number one groupie. But um, I was so appreciating when I was listening to you talking about the fact that we're, we're not very honest. You know, we, we say we've removed a lot of the stigma around conversations around mental health or physical health. But actually, when you say, how are you or who are you to people, actually, you end up still, it might be I'm struggling or it might be but it's still relatively superficial. So I so appreciate the fact that, because I'm sure a lot of people look up to you. Often when people are successful, we assume everyone's got everything sussed. And I think the fact that you're saying you are kind of flawed and deeply imperfect is, it's so refreshing. And I 
wonder kind of how are you today how does life feel yeah life actually feels really good at the moment um it feels relentless i i feel like i'm in that place where people just constantly say how are you and i'm like yeah busy and i have to ad probably address that at some point in 2023 um but really good like i've got two amazing kids and an incredible wife and you know i do think if it all ended tomorrow i would be so happy with what i've done what i've experienced you know i just think life is about experiences and doing fun things and going back to stoicism again I, I live with the phrase memento mori it is like the thing i remind myself of daily memento mori basically means remember you're dying now you can look at that and think what a negative thing to remind yourself about every day but the truth about memento mori right is that we're all dying like the sad thing is i can give everyone in this room uh, a terminal diagnosis right now now i don't know how long you've got right days weeks hopefully many many years but you need to live with that mindset of memento mori that it, like if you go forward to 100 years like your brand is amazing right in 100 years it may well not be here okay you definitely won't be here everyone you've ever worked with won't be here it's unlikely that you or my kids will even be here like that's only 100 years that is the blink of an eye and everything that we know is gone and i think if you can live with that mindset it is actually right really freeing you just kind of you don't care about stuff so much not in not in a way that you just sit on the sofa and eat crisps all day because you don't care but and it's in a kind of the small shit doesn't bother you anymore sort of way yeah no i totally agree i think it's so easy to get wrapped up in life mm. life feels so busy yep. and i know at the moment it can feel particularly hard for people and it's winter as well and it's dark and it's so easy to just be like in a few months when this happens i'll be happy as opposed to being like actually i appreciate what i have right now and i love this sense of someone talking about the other day that instead of saying i have to do this i have to do all these busy things in my life it's reframing it as i get to do it yeah you know, i get to wake up in the middle of my, my kids because how True. lucky am i to have them and it's and how are you yeah i'm i'm okay thank you i've been i've been a bit around the houses actually i've had a really good six months i've been on a bit of a kind of self-development journey revisiting some things i've not really ever visited a lot of kind of things from my childhood that i just wasn't really ready to do I wasn't in a good enough place and it's been quite heavy but now it's so freeing i feel like someone well took a lot of weights off which is amazing but yeah i've got a two-year-old and three-year-old and they've both been kind of like on and off poorly all weekend and you know what it's like when you're like no well and that's where i say no i get to parent them and it's and it's amazing you know i think one of the challenges that you've got is when you create a brand and a business and a movement like you have, there is, a, there is constant expectation of growth, right? It always has to be, every year has to be bigger, whether it's turnover or profit or products or impact or follower, like it is unrelenting and it is exhausting. I think sometimes it's just good to remind yourself that life doesn't work like that. Even a flower, right, takes three or four months a year off and just lays under the ground and goes dormant. And I used to really struggle with this. I was like, constant constant and i used to struggle on holiday i'd go on holiday with my wife back when she was my girlfriend and after a day i'd be like harry i'm ready to go again i want to get home and get on with it and i remember her dad actually he's a wise guy he said to me another way of framing the word recreation is recreation and you you have to remind yourself that you can't go a hundred percent 100 miles an hour every day beast mode all the time it's unhealthy for you. It doesn't allow you to stop at any point and assess where you've been and where you're going to. It, but it's hard because you particularly are in a world where it, that's how you're measured. So the challenge for you all the time is how do I not judge myself in the way that the whole rest of the world judges me? I know. It's always an interesting one, isn't it? I feel that everyone is existing in this place where, like, because now what you see, right, is perfection. You see perfection everywhere you look because all people put on social media is the end game, like the complete article. So it's very difficult for you to constantly like see perfection and not want it. This is a pl not you, this is for everybody. And I saw a brilliant video the other day of an old guy and he was saying the problem with the world is not greed. The problem with the world is envy. We're not greedy for more. We're envious because we see more. And he's saying that, you know, 100 years ago when we all had less, we were actually happier because it wasn't shoved down our throats. Like you didn't know before social media what your other rivals were really doing you didn't know where your mates were going on holiday you know i've just come off the tube here and there's that amazing setup down the road from you that building with all the huge screens and i got off the tube and saw it and i was like 
that's cool, but every single person is on their phone filming this. And it's like, have you not in- experienced this? Unless you've either filmed it or sent it to your mates or put it on your Instagram or whatever. So this is a real like global health challenge for our kids to be dealing with, actually. This constant comparison with other people. But it's more, it's, and I, I completely agree, but I think it's, it's the constant comparison, but it's also the idea. And this is one of the reasons that I wanted to be having conversations like this is that I, I really don't believe there is a finished article to your mm. point at the beginning there, because I think that looking after your total well-being is a kind of daily piece of work to an extent. Yeah. And I think this idea that you could do a bit of work, you could do some meditation or you could do some manifesting or you could change your diet and you could do this, di- you know, this kind of plan for six weeks. It's, it's just not how it works. Like ultimately no one is perfect. There is no kind of one route to perfection and then you're just finished and it's a tick box exercise. And I think it's such an important conversation to have because I think you can easily look at people and be like, right, they've done it. Yeah. And I, I don't think anyone has ever done it. Um, I think you can get better at it, but I don't think it's as simple as it can feel on Instagram. Yeah. And I guess what I'm really interested in exploring is kind of what the catalyst moment is in a lot of people's lives to start to really change the way that they're living or framing the world or thinking about the world. And I know you've been kind of quite honest about your journey there. And I wondered if we could, yeah, go back Mm. to the sort of early 2000s when you were potentially kind of in a a darker period of your life and and the impact that had on you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and I'll happily talk about it because the reason why I want to talk about this is because I don't know whether one of my kids or your kids or someone else's kids or even someone listening to this is having the same thing and there's a reason why suicide is the biggest killer of young men and it is because they don't talk to someone so what basically what i had was was like really intrusive thoughts where i just thought i was going to do something horrendous or something horrendous was going to happen now it's very easy now in hindsight to sit here 20 years later and go why were you worried that you were just gonna do something crazy like why would you think that but when you're in the moment and you don't have the anyone around you saying this is just like your brain playing a trick on you and you're choosing to believe the trick it feels real and when it feels real it feels really really scary and I think it's worth remembering that you know we're talking about like just to paint the picture for your listeners this is 2001 when I've just landed a job as one of the newest presenters on the CBBC channel children's BBC at the time and I, I can almost remember the moment that it kind of happened, which is a weird thing to even say in itself, because when you talk about mental health, you don't normally think of it as a moment. Do you know what I mean? It's often like a slow decline. But for me, it absolutely was not that. So had you ever struggled with your mental health prior to this moment? No, no. I like life wasn't great. Like for me as a young guy, I had an amazing family, very loving, really normal, simple Norfolk countryside upbringing. Um, but I was I didn't excel in any way. I wasn't in any of the sports teams at school. I was never in the school plays or the school choir. I didn't get great grades. Got fired from McDonald's as a teenager for lack of communication skills. Which feels Hello, just so ironic. By the way, <laughs> I know. Weird, right? Um, then I failed my A-levels. But this was kind of like, in some ways, I remember failing my A-levels and just... My si- I think it was my sister just said, oh, you've done it again. But that was the kind of feeling, really, was just like... It wasn't like, oh, I'm this amazing guy that's had this bad moment. That was just kind of like par for the course for me, really. And then I went back to school to redo my A-levels. I had to return to school to redo them. And it was on the day that I went back that there was a letter from a a teacher um, who'd been written to by a local TV company saying, do any of your students studying politics want to come on a TV show and talk about politics? Which I then went and met them and said, look, I've failed my A-levels. My mates have gone off abroad or they've gone to university. I'm like the but actually with the family I've messed up, can I come and work with you? That led to work experience, which led to the the offer of a job, which led to Children's BBC. And I remember my mum and dad dropping me off in London the the, the day that I went down to London. And as they drove off, I'd never left home. I'd never even lived outside Norfolk. I'd spent a few days outside, but not much. And as they went away, I just burst into tears, like real proper you know, that like, ugly crying that you do where you just cannot help it. And I thought that was kind of weird. And then it was only a few days later that I was going with my wife to Paris for a weekend break. And I still remember it as clear as day. I was on an escalator going down the Canary Wharf tube station. And it was like a really busy station. And this voice in my head 
was just like you what, what if you went on a rampage and did something crazy in this station and instead of like me going yeah that's what people have these thoughts right like when you're driving your car and you think what if i just steered into another car or into the central reservation you just dismiss it as a nothing thought my brain didn't dismiss it it went oh why have you thought that and then it just led to this build up of intrusive thoughts that and the sad thing is on average it takes men about 10 years to reach out for help when they have a mental health problem like that's 10 wasted years so i didn't actually mention this to anyone i just thought i mean i genuinely thought i can't believe it this is it this is the end like somehow this is just going to end badly and i thought i mean i remember thinking to myself i could hire like a bodyguard to live with me and keep an army all the time <laughs> ridiculous shows you how you can be affected though or maybe i could um cut my hands off so that i can't do anything crazy like all these ridiculous thoughts then that makes you feel even worse then at the same time you try to have a smile on your face and host kids telly and then that feels like even more of a charade because you're putting on this smiley face and entertaining the nation it's it just felt so real so scary so inevitable um and because it was a long time ago there wasn't really much opportunity for help in those days not really you know and in the end i actually rang an 0898 number in the back of like a daily newspaper like a national paper and spoke to someone i explained this and this person that was the first moment of a chink of light where this person went listen if you're ringing me worrying about this th you, you're not the sort of person that does these things you know you need to calm down and understand that young men particularly have these kind of existential periods it's called pure O. Oh, if anyone's listened to this and thinks what is you know i feel maybe i'm in this or i don't understand it pure O oh is the the theory of sort of invasive thoughts that you can't control, right? And you can't control them because you believe them. So he was the first person that said this, I pr promise you this is a nonsense. You need to tell someone. But then that's our big deal, right? And my wife, as she was then my girlfriend, she was amazing. We just sat there one day and she definitely noticed I was getting thinner. I used to, s like my side of the bed would be wet with sweat at night. I used to dread nighttime because that was like, I would just be awake all night worrying about myself and sometimes she'd roll over and go whoa what the you know like literally soaking wet and i'd be like no i don't know what that is i don't know just dismiss it and brush it off so then i explained to her i said like, for months i've had this fear and these mad thoughts and she just looked at me and said you you're the guy i love you're not going to do anything like that I, like, and i said to her like are you not at all worried that i've just said that she said no like not even remotely and that was then another massive oh what a lift and then eventually went to therapy recommended by someone because i'd started to talk about it then and this woman was again amazing and just said your brain playing a trick most men don't talk and that's why a lot of them end up dead so it's so good that you're talking and i think my issue now with mental health is things have moved on massively but i think people skirt around it still like even now it feels nerve-wracking to say oh i just thought i I genuinely thought I was going to do something crazy because you worry people will listen to it and go, oh, maybe he is. Like, what? So we have to talk about it in that way rather than the coded way, which is, oh, I'm struggling a bit. Oh, yeah, I'm not great. Or even worse, yeah, life's fine, I suppose. Or just not mentioning it at all. Um, but it was, a, it was a, a very, very challenging period. But now I, now I sit here 40, 44 years old, like, you know, over 20 years later. And I, honestly, Ella, I am glad that I went through that, you know. Um, I just think it, uh, I think it almost makes you feel like if, you, if that can come your way and you can cope with it, then you can cope with so much. And I think often as human beings, we underestimate our resilience for dealing with the stuff. Oh, I completely, I completely agree with that. I think if you can somehow turn a very, very difficult experience into something that has a positive end mm. to it, that there's something extraordinarily empowering about that. And I've certainly found that in my life. How long, how long did that kind of period last for you? I think probably it lasted three or four years, I reckon. The, the challenge is now, like even, even now I sit here and feel like a slight fraud when I talk about it, because actually if you, if you take a 44 year old and they've had four years of struggle, like that's 10% of my mm. life that I've had this for. So in some ways I feel like a, a fraud when I say I've had a mental health challenges, right? Because, I, but I think that's an important conversation to have as well. Like I love the phrase, nothing lasts forever, right? And that 
that was proven in that period when I was not that great and I'm now really happy. But I think it's an important thing for everyone to understand that nothing lasts forever because I think it equips you for any eventuality. So, you know, like you sit here now, you've just done a bit of work on yourself, your business is flying, you look incredible, you've got amazing staff all around you, you've got two wonderful kids, a brilliant husband, you've got your health, like wonderful, right? It's really important that you recognize that none of that lasts forever. But at the same time, if people are listening to this and they are struggling and they're perhaps in a place that I was 20 years ago and they don't see a way out, I would also like to remind them that nothing lasts forever. It's a, I think it's one of the most powerful things that you can remember. Completely. And I think when you are in a very difficult place, you know, you say four years isn't that long, but when you're in those four years, it can feel like yeah. a very, very long time. And I really, one of the reasons I really want to talk to you is that I so appreciate the way that you say, and I, I hadn't really thought about it like this until I heard you talking about it, the fact that yes, we've removed some stigma around mm. mental health and that's amazing and same with physical health, but only to an extent. And as you said, we're now able to say, yep, I've been having a bit of a hard time with my mental health and know that that will for the most part be very kind of warmly received yeah. and accepted by people and people will say, I'm very sorry to hear that. But actually the reality of what that looks like, I think we are still quite bad yeah, at talking about. Let's make no, like, I think it's important we make no bones about this, right? I, I got in the car the other day and I heard a radio DJ go, why does everyone seem to have a mental health problem these days? Every celebrity that I ever hear wants to share the story of their mental health. Why are we so unresilient? Why are we all so weak? What's, and it's like, no, hold on. This is an, I think the other thing that I really want to say is this is a natural part of life. Like, have you ever not had a physical injury? No. Have you told people about it? Yes. Has, does anyone go, oh, why does everyone seem to have pulled muscles these days? Of course they don't, because it's like, this is the norm. Like, we all accept that we get pulled muscles, or we go in the gym and hurt our shoulder, or like we have a period where we've got a bad knee and we can't play football or hockey or whatever it is. Let's have this idea that it's totally normal to struggle with our mental health. Right, and that's the whole point, isn't it? It's like our well-being isn't a linear path for anybody, yeah. you know, and there's going to be certain bumps and blocks in the road, whether that's facets of your mental health, physical health, grief, and so on, to your whole point at the beginning. Like, none of us know what life has in store. Mm. And so my, what I feel very passionate about is that, as I said, you can kind of theorize well-being until the cows come home, but you've got to start to look at how do you actually start to apply these tools, whether that's things you learn in therapy or kind of different facets of self-care into your life because these difficult periods do come, whether they're to you or to somebody close to you. And it's actually, what are the best ways to get through yep. that? And and I had very intrusive thoughts actually after my first daughter was born and I never talked about it. I would say, yeah, you know, it's quite hard or yeah, I feel quite overwhelmed. Yeah. But I was very embarrassed because I just to your point, I thought people would think I was really crazy yeah. um, or that I wouldn't. And even be a now, safe would you mom. ever tell people what those thoughts actually were? Or yeah, would you just you call know, them intrusive thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I would now would, yeah. but I think it took me quite a long time to feel really comfortable that I was just absolutely, actually, I'll tell you something interesting on this. I was absolutely fascinated and paranoid about just all dangers. Yeah. And so I was absolutely terrified. Every time I walked down the stairs, I was terrified I would drop her or I was in the bath. I was going to drop her and she would drown or I was standing at a red light with the pram and I would let go of the pram into oncoming traffic. Yeah. And it, to your point about what you were saying, I didn't want to do any of those things that never crossed my mind, but I was so conscious about what would happen if I did. And we were having this conversation in the office earlier today and four people said that's how i feel every time i'm in a tube station but we never talk about it yeah. right and i wonder how many people are listening and one of my colleagues was saying you know i always stand at the back yeah. because I'm, I'm nervous what happens if someone pushes me you know we look at that oncoming tube coming really really fast and we all have these flashes of thoughts yeah. and we think oh am i a bit crazy and i think it's to your point it's not that we need to kind of like really delve into that means every day i'm having a mental health crisis I think it's just normalizing yeah. kind of the fact that our brains can be quite messy. Our lives can be quite messy. You know, I know when I was kind of had all my challenges with my physical health 10 years ago, I felt my mental health was so much worse because I wouldn't talk about my physical health with people because I was embarrassed. And I think that's still the case for so many people now, mm. you know, often I'll go to a wedding or a party 
and someone's quite drunk and they'll come and tell me all about all the problems they're having stomach problems or whatever else and they're like I don't want to talk to anyone about it but because I've shared quite openly my story they're really comfortable telling me and I think it's just this normalization of the fact that we all have these challenges and and how do we go through them and I guess that's what I'm really curious from you kind of were there any tools that you started to put in place or ways of taking care of yourself or thinking about your mindset or reframing situations that this kind of difficult period taught you that have made a really fundamental difference over the last 20 years yeah I mean the biggest one is when I was told this is your brain playing a trick and then you see this all the time you know my wife won't mind me saying on here that like she gets pretty anxious she you know I wouldn't say she has mental health challenges but like a lot of people she, you know she's a busy mum of two kids and there's a lot going on in her life and she does have like these irrational fears and you know like um a few little phobias right and I now just say to her listen this is just your brain playing a trick and then you're choosing to believe that trick which is exactly what I was told you know you can write any story and actually it's a great reminder of the power of thought like if you can if I or you can write one of those tricks and then believe it to such an extent that in my case it damaged my mental health for four years let's totally reverse that and say if I truly believe that great stuff can happen and I'm expecting it at any moment then imagine the possibilities on the other side and I think that people who live a great life and achieve great things and find real happiness they've managed to unlock that trick which is almost like um, being a gambler they're just constantly gambling that every day an amazing opportunity will come they gamble that every person they meet could be the game changer for them they gamble that every time they um, invest in a business or something it's going to go well they gamble that every time they go for a job interview it's going to be the job interview that changes their life now the reason why those people find that things are so brilliant and successful for them is because they're expecting the good stuff so they're expecting the optimistic outcome therefore they spot the opportunity and they are only really sort of attracted to people who are similar to them. I think it's a really, really powerful mindset to have that feeling that something great is going to happen. Now, I totally get that people might listen to this and go, yeah, but that's not going to actually change what happens. <laughs> but I think it gets you much closer to it happening. Like, absolutely believe, just totally believe that you are deserving of great stuff and great stuff is going to happen your way. To the point where, just be an actor or an actress. And imagine you're playing the role of someone who just believes that some, something amazing is going to happen this week. Wake up tomorrow and play that role for one week and just see what happens. Just enter every situation in your life with that belief that the amazing thing you want is going to come. And just see how negative people melt away because they feel a bit threatened. How other really positive people come your way and suddenly they want to talk to you. But also how you suddenly notice opportunity. And I think that there's no greater example of what the human mind can do than negative or positive thinking. So that was a real big one for me. And did you always have that mindset? Uh, no, not no, I didn't, no. You um, learned it. That was definitely something that, that I picked up in that period. Um, it's, which is an interesting question because like, why, why was I the guy that went to this TV channel and said, give me an opportunity? Why was I the guy that created a showreel and sent it around to everyone? Why was I the guy that kept going for auditions on TV shows I loved? despite not getting the jobs, I've got a great big stack of rejection letters at home. Why was I the guy that went for an interview and an audition for CBBC and got it? Why was I the guy that put himself forwards for being an F1 presenter? I mean, I had a meeting with the BBC Sport a year before I got the F1 job. And I kind of told them my story of A-level failure, McDonald's sacking, not going to uni. And I was told, BBC Sport don't employ people like you. And I was like, wow, okay. So I had to find another way to find that job on Formula One and I actually just went to the head of football and I just said look I've been told that you don't employ people like me and I think what they meant was you're not a journalist and you're not an ex-sports person you know you're a that morning I was dressed up as a lobster running around the Blue Peter Garden popping balloons of foam right I kind of get where they're coming from um, but why was I the guy that then tried to find another way to get that job and I ended up just taking an ISDN kit and going around and doing reports from various football matches and then why was I the guy that backed himself to to carry the BBC's Formula One programme as a sort of 29-year-old that had never hosted live sport before in his life? I think the answer is that I did have an optimism that I just didn't realise I had. I don't know whether I had a self-belief. I think maybe that comes later. Like, I love the phrase, 
success leaves clues. So I think talking about self-belief, if someone hasn't tasted or felt it, is is a tricky one. But I think optimism is something that anyone in any situation can have. And, you know, there was nothing special about me. I came from nowhere special. I had no special knowledge or any special skills. And really, that's why I wanted to create the High Performance Podcast, to let people know that there is no secret. Optimism, actually, probably is the secret when you break it all down. Is there anything more important or empowering than optimism? So that was a really key thing. And I, I think the final thing I learned in that period was just a real understanding that, you know, life is a bit like a, you know, like an egg timer, yeah? Where all the sand at the bottom has gone. So there's no point thinking about that. And the stuff above isn't yours because you don't have it yet. You don't know how much sand is up there. You don't know what it holds. What's the point allowing yourself to go there? You get one part of life, right? Which is that one grain of sand right in the middle of that egg timer. That's the only bit you've got. So if you can't approach that with optimism and we'll probably come on to talking about this, what we call on the podcast, world-class basics, just making good daily decisions. If you can't approach life with optimism and making good decisions, um, then there's something wrong because I believe anyone can do that. And with your, and by the way, I totally believe that optimism builds because mm. I was not an optimist in yeah. any shape or form. And when I met my husband, it was like someone had put a really horrible mirror in front of me. I mean, we met, we moved in together a week later. Like there was this very strange soul connection, whatever you want to call it. But it was very clear that I was actually really not that happy and was really, really struggling. And in seeing him and his family, it kind of shone a lot of lights for me. And I realized I was actually really not a happy person. And I really was quite pessimistic. And... It was, and I really worked so hard on becoming an optimist. And I used to write down things I was grateful for every day. And I would do that exercise every day. And it just became easier and easier and easier and easier. And kind of eight years later, my natural disposition is to find all the reasons why today was great. And it's, God, it's been so worthwhile. But I do, I do think you can change, you know, and everything I've ever read about kind of neuroscience and neuroplasticity definitely confirms that you can change it i think it's a habit you just got to keep as we say you've just got to keep working on it which is something else i want to ask you about especially in self-belief and you talk about this idea of not sitting in the comfy chair and i i've become quite kind of convicted and just you know kind of bear with me because it sounds quite depressing but that happiness and particularly your mental well-being but your whole well-being because i think that there's no real distinction between your mental well-being and your physical well-being because the the better you feel in your mind the more you want to take care of your body I really think that it's a daily discipline for so many of us and it comes from continuously showing up and working on those aspects. And I'm really curious, you were saying with self-belief, you didn't have as much of it potentially when you started, kind of how you fostered that to keep putting yourself out there because I think that's one of the things that really holds us back from our lives. We kind of potentially know what we want or what our values are and what's misaligned with the way we're living. But going out and actually doing that, putting yourself out there is terrifying. We're all kind of inherently of, probably a bit nervous of rejection of failure Mm -hmm. um and also this this inherent need to actually get out of the chair and realize when we do need to do that and put ourselves out there what's the worst that can happen what is the worst that can happen if you are the sort of person that doesn't dare do it for whatever reason i would just encourage you to write down the single worst thing that can happen if you put yourself out there and then ask yourself if you can deal with it it seems so simple, but it holds so many people back. The fear of the unknown. Actually, when you break it down, and there is no fear of the unknown, you make it the fear of the known, right? These are the things that that will happen if I put myself out there and it, and it, and I fail. Um, and probably most of them don't actually matter. Well, you, I, I would be amazed, staggered, if people couldn't cope with all, with all of them, almost all of them, in truth, mm. you know, because these are things that you want to do. So I I think there's a few things that sort of spring to mind. Like the first thing is why are you putting yourself out there, right? I think it's really important uh, to listen to like a sense of envy. You know, that thing that I said earlier about, you know, people aren't greedy, they're envious. People are envious, I think, of other people. That's what goes on in this world. Um, But I like the idea of envy. So ask yourself, right? If you really want to do something and you're envious of someone or something, ask yourself, why? Well, the answer will be because you want it. That's great. 
that is a north star for your life that is a kind of a real marker that you have to listen to and go i feel a sense of envy about that so therefore i'm going to chase it right so that's the first thing you have to you have to allow yourself to want great things okay the second thing is a mindset that you deserve to have great things i think everybody deserves happiness and success and positivity and great people around them um like life is gonna slap you across the face and kick you in the nuts at any given moment so please don't do it to yourself because there's enough of that already you know you need to be nicer to yourself than anyone else I mean, sometimes I say to Harriet, my wife, like she'll pick up the phone and she'll go, oh, hi, yeah, I'm just wondering if you have a table spare for lunch. To the- okay, no, no problem. Yeah, okay, all right. Thank you. And it's no problem. Thank you, thank you, bye. Oh, no table, but I think, that, you know, you told me too late that there wouldn't be a table. And, like, and I'm like, hold on, you've just spoken nicer to a person you'll never meet in your life than how you spoke to me straight afterwards. And I'm your husband and I'm the same. I'm just as bad. You know, I think we all do that. So I think we have to remember that you talk to yourself in the way that you would put on your very best phone voice or the way that you would speak to the king of England or whatever, like you're really precious and special. So it's very important that you feel a sense of envy, but then you're good to yourself and make yourself believe that you can get it. And I think the final salient point about this is like, why do people not do this stuff? Well, almost every time they don't do it, it's because they have a fear of failure. I was joined on my podcast by a guy called Greg Hoffman, the chief marketing officer of Nike. And he said, failure is the price of ambition. And that is a quote that just stung me with, yes, it is. And I would just say to everyone listening to this brilliant podcast of yours, seek failure. Seek failure every single day. Realize that failure is where growth is. And reframe your mind about failure. When you're in the gym and someone says, lift that weight to failure, you don't go, I can't lift that to failure because I don't want to fail. Well, you know in your head, if you lift a weight to failure, what happens next time you go to the gym? You lift stronger, you lift heavier, you lift for longer. Let's take football training. Is it football training or is it football failing? The best footballers in the world take 50 free kicks at the end of training and they might miss 40 of them. But when it comes to the match, they score that free kick because they've done not the practice, not the training, they've done the failing. So seek failure all the time. If you are listening to this and you're like, I haven't failed for a long time, then that's not great. You need to exist in a place where failure is almost inevitable because the failure is where the growth is. It's a really, really important thing for people to understand. And I actually think that when we talk about purpose, life is not about achieving those great moments. Johnny Wilkinson told me that after 20 years of hard graft, he was thrilled for 30 seconds when he won the Rugby World Cup, right? Is that climb worth that view? I would argue not, an incredible achievement but the joy lasted for 30 seconds. I think this is an important one for people to understand. Happiness in life, I don't believe, comes from achieving stuff. It doesn't come from growing your business. It doesn't come from what's the turnover. It doesn't come from how big is my house, how new is my car, how impressive is my job title, how large is my salary. Those things are all nice, right? But they are not where happiness lies. Happiness actually lies in pushing through the negative stuff, in in getting past the hard bits, in growing, in thinking I can't get there and realizing that you did get there. And I think it's an important mindset because I think we live in a world of delayed happiness where everyone is thinking happiness is around the corner and they're gonna be happy when they get all of those trappings that modern life tells you you need. But then you get to the end and you realize you were on this, well, what they call the hedonic treadmill. You're on this treadmill thinking you're going to get this hedonistic, magical moment at the end of it. And what I would just say is, please don't live your life waiting for that moment, thinking it's going to bring you happiness. And as you breathe out your last breath, looking back and realizing that it was the moments that the happiness was there. It wasn't reaching a moment. Like, this is it, right? Me and you having a conversation here. This is what this podcast is about. If 15 million people listen to your podcast, lovely. There's no happiness in that. This is the happiness. This like connection, this great conversation, this is what you have to be grateful for. But also I think that, and, and I resonate with it so much, but I think the thing is, is that there is no end goal. You know, it's like yeah. ultimately, and I think we can all be guilty of this, myself very much included, but I've been very much kind of checking in on it, particularly this year, is that you can always 
play the like once I've got to this point everything's going to be so easy and we've certainly played that with kind of getting the business you know off the ground and to this point which is like cool once this problem sorted it's going to be great once we get this listing it's going to be great once we just get this manufacturing challenge sorted or whatever it is you know and I had this moment a few months ago where I was like you know we set out we launched our first products yes six years ago now to build to see if we could build you know we said this experiment we're going to build an all-natural plant-based food products business not really been done before can we do it and I said to my husband I was like I actually think we've done it and I don't think we've appreciated that I was like you know we're now you know we've got all the listings we set out to do we've got these amazing kind of sales points about how we're outselling all these brands that never in a million years did we even wonder if we could compete against and yet we're still looking at what's next and it's kind of like, at what point yeah. are you actually enjoying it and saying like, wow, I tried to do that and I've done it. And that is so cool as opposed to, you know, yeah, what the next slog is. And I think I do, there is something interesting here though, right? Because obviously I spend a lot of my time around sports people. Mm. And whenever I talk to retired footballers about this, they almost to a man and woman will say to me, I didn't enjoy it because I was just like, as soon as we won a game, it was about winning What's two next? in a row. If it was a title, it was about defending the title. If it was one Premier League, I wanted two. You know, let's take Formula One as a good example. Lewis Hamilton, no doubt, won his first race and thought, I want a title. And then when he won his first title, he thought, well, I want to equal Michael Schumacher. He's now equal Michael Schumacher with seven titles. Now he will absolutely want eight titles. Now, how crazy are our brains that I can almost guarantee you what Lewis Hamilton's thinking about is eight titles, not thinking, wow, I've won seven titles. But here's the thing, if if you didn't think like you do, and if they didn't think like they did, I do question whether you would have the same success. I don't, I don't think it's an especially healthy or brilliant way to live, right? Because I don't think you appreciate what happens. You don't see the growth. And, and it's sad to go, oh my goodness, we've done it. And it's kind of happened almost without us really enjoying it. That's the truth, right? Like if I said to you, right at the beginning when you were bringing out your first product or now which was easy which is easier oh hard question they're kind of equal which i don't think was the answer you were looking for equal um, is fine but here's the thing you would imagine that it's an awful lot easier when you've got 25 how many staff do you have yeah almost 50 right 50 staff lovely office you know, no doubt you're now financially secure. Of course, it's easier. No, it isn't. It's as hard now mm. as it was when it was you and your husband with all those dreams and all that grafting. Which gave you more pleasure, that first product or the latest product you just brought out? Yeah, it's true. It's the Truth, first. Truth, the yeah. first product. Yeah, completely. Now that is mad. Insane. Your first product gave you more joy than all of the amazing stuff you've achieved since then. So it can't be about the end goal. It can't be about the products. It has to be about the process it can't it's not, be about the outcome and that's been our kind of big focus now it's like you've just got to see every day as an adventure you know you could sit here today and be like oh i'm quite nervous about this interview or quite nervous about this new premise or i'm quite nervous about this new launch or you could say to your point you've not really got anything to lose that's let's mm. just enjoy it and let's see what happens and again that mindset shift has been so 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 huge for me particularly in, in enjoying it and also realizing like to your point like what's the worst that can happen take yeah. more time take do you think more about infinite purpose ever so infinite purpose is like you still need to have a purpose right because i think living a purpose-driven life is a really good way to operate 100 percent. the challenge is how you how you frame that okay so um and this can really apply to anything let's take new year's resolutions if i decide i want to get a six pack right by march which i have been promising my wife for 20 years so any advice or products you've got that guarantee six packs i'll take them um you either get to March and you haven't got a six pack, right? And you go, bloody hell, I'm a failure. Or you get to March and you've got a six pack and you go, yes, I've managed it. I've got the six pack. Well, there's the same result for both of those things. You lose motivation. You either lose motivation because you don't get it or you lose motivation because you achieve it. Now, let's say, you know, if you set certain financial results for your business, right? You either don't get there and you feel like you failed or you surpass it and you think, why did I set such low target? What if I'd have set a much bigger target? So I would encourage people to set a challenge for themselves and have a purpose, but make it infinite. So when I first started high performance, I was like, I want 100,000 downloads of the podcast a week, then I'm happy. Well, we now have 500,000 a week. So where's that goal? The infinite purpose of high performance is 
to inspire more people every day to get closer to their own version of high performance. We can always reach more people because there's billions in the world. And we can always get them closer to high performance. You never actually get there. So I would encourage everyone, including you, with your, and you can have loads of different infinite purposes. The one for you personally, the one as a parent, the one as a business owner, the one as a friend, the one as a partner. Infinite purpose, it has no end, but it's always there as a kind of a North Star pushing you forwards. Yeah, no, and I feel very lucky because I think I have that inbuilt very deeply in me, which is the whole premise of, of yeah. why we do what we do and why we keep doing what we do, which is that I felt so passionately on day one, which is that I never wanted anyone to go through from a kind of health perspective what I'd been through. Yeah. And if I could help one person climb out of that, then it was a win. And to your point, like I don't really care if it's a million people or if it's two people. That's never, maybe almost from a kind of career business perspective to my detriment i really don't care um but uh the more the merrier but it's not why i do what we do if we got to talk to three people I, i'd be really happy if i felt those three people had had an impact um but i'm very interested in in the kind of definition of high performance and how as you said everyone's going to have their own version of it and i think that's so important you know we're not having this conversation or you're not having the conversations you're having to try and make people believe that perfect exists. So they've got yeah. to emulate someone else. But how do you start to understand what your version of high performance is? How do you define, how do you define it? Mm. So mine has changed massively since I've been doing the podcast to like, so I, I, the seeds of this podcast, I guess, were sown when I ended up in Formula One. So I grew up in this village thinking that there was successful people who had amazing lives. And then there was people like me who, you know, just like kid in a village, right? You know, growing up, probably going to get a job locally. I thought there was a secret. And it's only when, you know, I would say a large chunk of fate and luck. And I think when people are successful, they don't talk often enough about luck. And I think that can be a really alienating factor for people who haven't got there yet. They think, well, they've done all, you know, what about people that are just constantly grafting and working hard and giving it their all and it's not happening? You know, let's not discount how oh, yeah. lucky I was. Right time, right place is a powerful that thing. I, I was lucky that I failed my A-levels and that led directly to the opportunity in telly. Now there's obviously a whole other conversation about then you have to make the most of those opportunities which we've spoken about, the optimistic mindset, the belief that good things are going to happen, the hard work. Um, but I think that when, when I finally ended up in Formula One, I would say to people, like, how did you become a CEO or a billionaire or a team principal or a Formula One driver or whatever? Because it was the first time in my life I'd been in this kind of exotic world a long way away from a small village in Norfolk. And all of them would talk about hard work and resilience and self-belief and the ability to get knocked back down and get back up and f finding failure and all these other things. So I really wanted to share that because I was still surrounded in my world by the people I grew up with saying, well, my life's not going to be successful because those are the cards that I've been dealt right at the beginning. And I'd suddenly been opened up to this growth mindset that I wanted to share. The problem is you have to pick the right time to do that. So I then had that job in F1. I had to just make that successful because I just bought a house. I had to make sure I pay my mortgage. I was like signing one year contracts the pressure was there all the time just to deliver so I had to put this desire on the back burner and then the don't sit in the comfy chair advice I was given by my first boss led to me walking away from the BBC which people at the time thought was crazy I was offered a four-year contract to host Formula One match the day two World Cups Olympics Euros Commonwealth Games and Sports Personality of the Year that's like the golden offer for a sports presenter but I kind of, it, for me, it represented four years of doing exactly what I'd just done. How interesting to explore what it'd be like to help set up a whole new channel. So I left to join BT Sport. But then BT had spent hundreds of millions of pounds on the rights, something like 600 million. And I remember about a week before the channel launched, my new boss said, are you happy that 600 million pounds worth of TV rights resting on your shoulders? And I was like, well, I was fine until just now when you said that. So again, it wasn't the right time to have this conversation about you know, sharing this growth mindset with people. And actually, it's only now that I'm 44 that you, you think of that egg timer. And more than ever before, I have absolutely no idea how much sand is in the top, right? How much, how many grains am I going to get? I don't know. So I wanted to share this. Plus, I'm now a dad. I wanted to have conversations my kids could hear long after I've gone um, and be inspired by. And 
so I started thinking, I can't wait for people to hear about this hard work and this graft and getting knocked down and getting back up and getting kicked, mud kicked in your face and wiping it off and keeping on walking forwards. And in that, a way, a more superficial view of, of yes, success. Yes, that's what I thought it was. Yeah. But then when you start having these conversations, you actually realise that that is, of course, like that is part of the story. And it's fine to be like that and to do that. But you can only do it if it makes you happy. And this is a really long-winded way of saying that my definition of high performance has completely turned on its head. My definition of high performance can only be happiness. Because I see really successful, really high-achieving people who are deeply unhappy. I speak to the highest achieving sports people on the planet who are currently competing and are deeply unhappy. I speak to people who have come to the end of their careers, didn't enjoy any of it, now feel lost, no longer have a purpose, and they're deeply unhappy. I speak to people for whom all of their self-worth is tied up in what they do. And as soon as that melts away, then they feel they are nothing and have nothing. And they are deeply unhappy. So the only definition of high performance for me now is happiness. It's the only thing it can be. Doing the things that make you happy. Finding happiness in any given situation. And are there kind of tools that you implement every day to help support that happiness? Yes, definitely. So I talk about world-class basics because I also want people to understand that I think sometimes the name high performance can be a bit alienating. Mm. People look at it and go, well, I can't reach high performance. But it's about your own version of high performance. So it's all about world-class basics. Like for me, it is getting out of bed before any other member of my family is up. And that... I can't tell you how powerful that half an hour is. I'm the same. It's amazing, isn't it? And I know that like people will be listening to this going, don't, don't be a dick. You've got two kids and like f- you juggle three or four different jobs. You live in the country and spend your life traveling into London. I'm not getting up half an hour earlier, but it's not half an hour less sleep. It's like half an hour, not just half an hour more of life, but it's almost the most important half an hour. And I don't want that to sound bad that I'm on my own and my kids and my, my wife are not up. But if I can get up at that time, make a list of all the things on my mind, the things that I want to achieve that day and that week, light a candle, say, hey Siri, BBC Radio 3, let the dog out, drink an athletic greens before anything else goes in my body, then I'm happy. That is my way, that's the way that I start my day every day. And then after that, it's about you know, there's this great thing that a lot of psychologists talk about, which is looking at your day like a diamond necklace, right? And at the beginning of every day, there's no diamonds on that necklace. And your job is to put the diamonds on. So I, I remember watching Frozen with my kids. And I think it was Olaf or someone who said, just do the next right thing, right? That's trite. And it's a Disney film. But that's all you can do. Like, I believe that high performance do the best you can where you are with what you've got. If that's all you do, the best you can where you are with what you've got no one can ask for more than that from you because you can't do any more than the best you can you can't do it anywhere other than the way you are right now and you can't do it with the knowledge that you don't already have so we have to get rid of this mindset of like criticizing people for changing their mind or making what they call a u-turn you just didn't have the knowledge and then you grow because you get the knowledge so you change your mind and you believe something like you and i are different people now right the two people that started this conversation that sort of constant growth so I think it's really important that you just keep on putting those diamonds on that necklace throughout the day. Every single decision. Should I eat this? How should I speak to my wife or my children? Should I take a moment when I'm getting wound up and just breathe? Should I get up early at the beginning of the day? Should I believe that great things are going to happen to me? Should I realize that the way that I react to other people is entirely on me? Should I have a mindset that if I'd have lived the life they've lived, I would act exactly the same as them? So putting empathy at the absolute heart of the way that I operate and the way that I think. Should I go to bed early or should I stay up and watch a film? You know, you can stay up and watch a film, but you'll pay the price the next day. So, yes, it's about discipline. I think discipline is really powerful. And it's about realising that you deserve this sort of stuff. I think sometimes I speak to people and they're like, oh, no, I don't, I don't need to do that. And I know the truth is that I don't think that they feel they deserve it. But I always say to them, what you're... So you have such a big ego, you believe you're so perfect that there's nothing you can do to improve your day or improve your life. And I think if, 
if everyone just wrote down the way they live their day at the moment and asked, is that a world-class decision that I made at that point? Then I think they would find a lot of areas that they can improve. And it's not big stuff. It's the small, little, simple things that we can all improve on that I think will get people closer to their own version of high performance. So those are my kind of daily basics. And other than that, it is living in the country and spending time with my kids. But that's a very conscious choice because I'm sure you could have done more and more and more. Yep. And it's a very conscious choice to say that's what actually, to your point, is my definition of high performance, which is happiness, which is that shift in mindset, yep. that real focus on creating a positive mindset, part of which is not potentially doing another rung in your successful career, mm. but maybe taking one step back potentially to take a step forward but to have that time with your children and I yeah. think that's a really powerful thing to say because I think we're often quite scared of as a culture not taking opportunities so my thing with the kids is it's a non-negotiable for me that I will try and always sleep at home so I do a job that takes me around loads of different cities I'll often finish work you know in Manchester at half 11 at night and Norwich is a good four or five hours from there but I would rather do the journey wake up at home have that time with the kids so me and my son every single morning we've got a tiny like inflatable football that can't damage stuff and he's seven years old and we play first to 20 every morning without fail that period with sebastian that lasts about 10 minutes is absolute gold for me my daughter is like a born performer so she's doing uh drama art dance singing lessons she's doing her lambda you know the London Academy of yeah. Music. Um, and I don't think I've missed a performance yet. So those things are really like, those are non-negotiables for me that I want my children to see that dad always woke up in the house, always did the school run with them. I might go back to bed, by the way, after the school run. I'm a big believer in power napping because I just find it helps me. And I, that's not for everyone, but for me, a 20 minutes, you know, late morning, lunchtime is like golden if I can grab it. Um, so I'd rather work super late, get home, be with them, grab a power nap. But it breaks my heart to think that my daughter would ever look up and see that I'm not at her dance or drama. And the opportunity I know isn't there for everyone. But if you can make it work in your life, if you can have those conversations with your colleagues or your boss and say, look, I'm going to do the work. You know, I don't think there are many people that work much harder than me. Like, I really, like, I really graft, but I graft with the non-negotiable that um, kids first. Yeah, no, we're the same. Uh, and I will find the time myself to get the rest of it done, you know? Yeah, exactly. Missing bedtime is a once a year thing for us. It okay, just no. can't be done. No. Um, so what's, what is the next chapter for you on a kind of personal level? There anything you're working on or sort of developing? I am just excited. Like, that's kind of it, really. What a great thing to say. I think I kind of have, I've actually stopped making plans too much. Because again, like what happens, you either achieve the plan and you think, oh, why didn't I come up with something else? Or you don't get there and you feel like a bit of a letdown. You know, all I want to do is try and make kind of the best decisions every day and see where that takes me. Um, I'm 44, so I'm definitely at a point where life experiences is, is, what I, is what I really cherish. You know, just simply sitting and having a coffee with friends is something that in years gone by when I was fully focused on a, TV career I was like I would forego that um, I definitely have, need to work on that like I'm not the best at small talk um, but it's just those like real sort of lived moments with people is what I want to enjoy but I think the other thing that I, I just am absolutely desperate to not finish this without telling people that like I am a, like a walking mistake I don't want them to listen to a conversation like this and I just think the, the world can be so alienating for people. Um, I just want to say that I came from a tiny village. There was nothing unique about me. Um, I got some really great luck along the way. I've learned a few things which hopefully I've shared with you in a way that makes a modicum of sense to a few people. The biggest one being optimism. Um, and I feel that I've kind of stumbled to this place without too much of a plan. So to start making a plan at 44 years old might be foolish. Um, I just want to stay healthy. I think that that is the 
you do start don't you to get this mindset of like i suppose the way that i look at it is that like we're constantly regenerating so the you know the eyes that i've got are not the same ones i was born with right the hair has grown the skin is constantly shedding all of this stuff there's only one thing that i'm made of now and that's the food i've eaten so that is a that is a big mindset shift for me that every single thing that goes in my body regenerates my body so what do i want to be regenerated out of hopefully the good stuff so um if i can stay healthy do a bit of exercise um well, hopefully i'll come and talk to you again in 10 years time and you would have learned a huge <laughs> amount since i think it's it's so humble Same. to say it's a mistake and i so appreciate that because i think that that's part of life isn't it as we've said like life is anything but linear and i think it's so important to acknowledge that but equally there's so many mistakes and so many ups and downs that we we can learn from and i think that's yeah. what helps us move forward and start to implement those learnings to hopefully whilst not linear create an upward trajectory i think so ella i think you're right and i think just People just need to be kind to themselves. Like, I'm a worrier. And to each other. Like, are you, do you worry? I'm a worrier. Born oh, worrier. Full catastrophizer. When I used to go out, right, as like an 18-year-old, 19-year-old, I used to lay in bed the next morning, panicked about what I did, where I went. What I, you said. I, what I said. I was like, what did I say? Well, I, I could remember it all. but And I remember thinking, why am I so worried? And then I got onto kids today and it became worse. Because I was like, well, I'm a kid today now. Did someone see me drinking? Did I smoke a cigarette? Well, and I'm like that now. So, like... There's not a lot of peace when you have that kind of a mind. So even after this, I'll leave going, oh, did I say anything? It's like, did, was it okay? I think so it's just about being kind to yourself, realizing that everyone has got all sorts of mad stuff spinning around in their heads all the time. So just treat yourself well. Yeah, and everyone else, because you don't know what everyone else is thinking. And I think that's one of our Correct. big mistakes in the world we live in is that, as we've said, it's we all have our ups, but we very much all have our downs. And mm. I think you never really appreciate you know when you were going through that very dark period no one around you knew and there'll be people you come in contact with every single day there'll be people everyone listening would have seen today who will be having a difficult time and i think the bigger the lens of compassion we can bring yeah. i think you've got to do it to yourself first to be able to give it to other people but i think the more we can do that the more we'll all move forward in a in a better way but honestly jake can't thank you enough for your time today and for your Real honesty, as I said at the beginning, I think what I so appreciate about you is this mix of real honesty and vulnerability, but with this kind of very can-do attitude of let's move forward from mm. that and let's keep going, let's keep being grateful for the opportunity to keep growing, which I think is quite a rare combination and I really like it. Well, I really appreciate the kind words and thank you for the invite. Pleasure. <laughs>